Hello, welcome back. So now we're coming to part two of Ismins. So we're going to learn whether or not new Ismins can be created. If so, how? If not, why? All right, so as I mentioned in my first video, is that you already have a general categories of Ismins. Like for example, right to use staircase, right to use the walk path on your neighbor's property, right to park cars even. But the issue arises in the 21st century, sometimes you have this type of rights which you have never considered before. For example, Wi-Fi or TV reception. Whether or not if someone interferes with this right, you can sue them because there's a breach of your easement to enjoy this particular type of right. And even for example, this building. Imagine if it's a block of flat. So you want to install a TV satellite, for example, a satellite dish. So if it's on other people's property, would it be considered as an easement? There's a license. Or you are prohibited from installing one at all. So we look into that further. So there are a few types of uh, categories whereby you can determine whether easements can be created. For example, apart from free and borrow money, so you must ensure that your other particular right or new type of easement does not infringe or interfere with the use of the servant owner. So in the case of hunter and canary crop, so it mentioned that when the canary rough tower was erected, it has interfered with the television reception. So the issue arises whether or not the residents surrounding the canary rough itself can sue them for breach of their easement. So whether or not it is considered as easement. So court actually refused to accept that the right in, in such a, the right that referring to the television reception itself could amount to uh, an easement. So court held that if you allow one person to sue because that his easement to television reception has been interfered, it will open floodgates to many type other suits. So court held that court rejected that claim of easement with regards to uh, television reception. So I guess same goes to Wi-Fi. So if you're talking about someone has interfered with your access to Wi-Fi, so I don't think you can sue or you can claim that you have an easement of Wi-Fi. So in the second case, with regards to right of an airspace, so we learned this actually in semester one, with regards to uh, whether or not you can measure your entitlement of right to an airspace. So we learned about lower stratum and higher stratum. As long as you can show proof that you've enjoyed a certain amount of airspace every day, then you can say that you have uh, an easement. So if someone interferes with your lower stratum of airspace, you can sue for trespass. So in this case, court held that the right to use the neighboring land as an airfield was considered as an easement. So the last part is a funny case with regard to right to use the toilet. Court held that uh, it amounts to an easement. So it means that you will be allowing your neighbors to use the your toilet in your house. And that particular right can be passed down to the new purchaser of the property unless it has been revoked by the owner or there are some sort of new agreements between the new purchasers of the two plots of land. Okay, so here you have a case with regards to parking of cars on a strip of land. So this is a case of Copeland and Greenhouse. So you have a serving property, which is a, a strip long road, and the serving owners actually use that land uh, to access to their orchard. So you have the dominant owners who's not to say taking advantage, but they have been using the strip of land to put cars because they are car repairers. So for cars are waiting to be repaired, so they'll put the cars there and subsequently they want to claim that they have an easement by way of prescription essentially because they have been using it for many years so they should be entitled to claim an easement so it means that the servant owner cannot stop them from parking their cars so court held that uh, such claim is not considered as easement it has been rejected because they are not claiming that they have an easement by way of prescription looking through the evidence and arguments they are claiming to have a joint possession of that piece of land. So court held that you can't do so. You can't claim that you have a possession on other people's land because you've been occupying it for a very long time. So this is the case of Copeland and Greenhaw talking about uh, parking of vehicles. 
but it has to be contrasted from the case of Wright and McCandom. So what happens in this case is that you have the plaintiff who lists the top floor to be the defendant. So when he lists it out, so a permission was given to Miss McCandom to, to use the shed in the garden to store her tools. So eventually the lease expired, so the plaintiff granted a new lease but in that list itself, nothing specified with the right to continue using the garden. So because plaintiff knowing that the defendant would want to continue using the shed to store the to store the coals, so he demanded payment. So court held that by allowing her to use it as a license last time, and when the lease was renewed, it has converted that license into an easement. So as such, Miss McAdam has the right to store coal in the shed as it amounted to an easement. But we'll go through the case of Wright and McAdam against as to how can a license be converted to an easement if there is such a way, uh, if it is, is it logical, is it acceptable? Because as you can see, the implication of Wright and McAdam is that it has been criticizing because if you solely using that garden shed and you're excluding the land owner itself, it shows proof that you have exclusive possession. So you're prohibiting even the land owner itself from using his own property. Alright, so with respect to easement to park vehicles, this has raised a lot of uh, actually a lot of arguments or discussions with respect to the academicians and other scholars because depending on the type of land itself, if it restricts the reasonable use by the servant owner, it can essentially mean that you have an easement over that property. Because what happens to the servant owner? He can't park his own car on his own property. So in order to ease your understanding, so you consider this. So let's say if the servant owner has a garage, which can only fit one car. So in such situation, if it can only fit one car, means that no easement can be granted. It's just a license. So as a matter of time, at any time, the servant owner can actually revoke that license. But the situation differs. Let's say if you have a plot of land or a garage which can fit six cars, big enough to fit as many cars as you can one, and also he can also put his car. So in this type of situation, it's different because it's not restricting the right of the servant owner. So as such, easement can be granted in this type of situation. So one example with regards to easement to park cars is the case of Bachelor and Marlowe. So Mr. Marlowe claimed a prescriptive easement to park up to six cars, not one but six. So if you look into the garage, six cars would cover the whole of servant land. So in this case, because it has restricted the use of the servant owner, court held no easements can, can exist. So you will make that restriction as the ownership of the servant owner illusory means that he, he can't do anything over his own piece of property. So you also have a case of Moncrief and Jamieson. So in this case it's different as opposed to the case of um, Bachelor and Marlowe because this case concerns that the, whereby the dominant, the dominant owner Without that access route, he has no way to park his car or no way to access to his property. So you look through the facts of this case. Mr. Moncrief, essentially, he has the right to access to his house, but only over Mr. Jameson's land. So he also has the right to park cars because otherwise he has nowhere, no other place to park over his own property. So in essence, it means that without the access route, Mr. Moncrief, land is landlocked. So he, if he is relying on that right of way and right to park his cars on Jamieson's land. So subsequently over the years, relationship fell out. There was a dispute between two of them. And now Mr. Jamieson is denying him right to park his car. So the court held that uh, this right will be implied if there was a reasonable necessary for the enjoyment of the main right. So in these circumstances, it was reasonably necessary for Mr. Moncrief to use that right of way and also to park his car. Because otherwise, he has no way to enter his own property. So the court held that these two rights could amount to an easement. 
So if you study the case of Moncrief and Jamieson, the test that used by the judges is actually different from the case of Bachelor and Marlowe. The case of Bachelor and Marlowe, court used the test of reasonable use as long as you can use it without restricting the right of the servant owner, you can have an easement. Whereas in the case of Moncrief and Jamieson, the court actually adopted the ouster principle. The ouster principle essentially means whether or not the servant owner retained possession and control over his own property. So in order to determine these two, so subsequent cases have decided and tried to distinguish between these two tests. And in the case of Verdi and Chena, court held that reasonable use should be considered and the law commissioner should make it should make it like a compulsory test in order to determine if someone is entitled to use an instrument, whether or not it's for reasonable use and enjoyment and whether or not it will restrict the right of Soviet owner. All right, so this is the end of part two on the topic of easement. So I'll continue on part three on my next video.